So basically, my specialist areas of interest, I'll go through this quickly. I was appointed 13 years ago, and my focus is on everything urological, but particularly uh, the prostate and the kidney. Um, I do lots of kidney laparoscopy. I work a little bit over at Frimley as well as here in Basingstoke, but my base is very much here. Um, and we've had a number of projects on the way, really, to try and improve the lot for men, particularly men, with prostates, um, both, on, both men with benign prostate enlargement and prostate cancer. Uh, there was an article today in the, in the Daily Mail, as there often is, about prostate problems. It makes for good press, which says that why not cutting out your prostate cancer may be your best bet. The reality is for some men it is their best bet and it's the right thing to do, but for a lot of men uh, they can be safely monitored or offered a treatment somewhere in between that fills the middle ground between a radical approach and a very conservative approach where we're essentially monitoring the situation. And the same is true for benign prostate problems where uh, we've got medication at one end of the spectrum and at the other end we've got big operations. And so where I think I, my focus is, is on trying to find minimally invasive alternatives for men that, that sort of sit there in the middle. Um, for a lot of men, um, this is a, you know, an attractive <coughs> option because, generally speaking, with a more sort of focused and minimally invasive tr uh, approach, the, the collateral damage, the side effect profile is better. So that's the urological anatomy. We're going to focus on the prostate gland there. And uh, I'll point it out, but th th this is the prostate gland here. Uh, it's, 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 it's embedded deep in the pelvic area, underneath the bladder. It's got some very important structures nearby, and, uh, and that's part of the problem. Uh, and you might ask what the prostate gland does. Um, it produces some of the constituents of ejaculatory fluid, basically. Um, and so it plays a, an important role in reproduction. But after that, it's not an awful lot of use. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> unless you like, well, I won't go into that. But, uh, so, so there are three things that can happen to the prostate. One is it can become enlarged. Sorry, one is it become, can become inflamed, and this is the most common reason for a male to see a urologist uh, is with symptoms of prostatitis, where the prostate becomes inflamed. But we're not going to talk much about that today. It, it's the least sexy of the three areas in terms of interest in giving you a talk, but it's a very common problem and one we're faced with frequently. Um, secondly, the prostate gland can grow and it grows with age. Uh, it's a quirk of male human physiology that the prostate gland grows under the stimulation of the male hormone testosterone. And thirdly, prostate cancer can develop. It's the most common non-cutaneous uh, malignancy in men. So this here is the, pro uh, the prostate gland and there's a, the, the urethra runs through the middle of the prostate gland and the, the big bits on either side the transition zone, that's the area that enlarges as we get older um, in a benign, non-cancerous way. And then there's the peripheral zone there, and that's where most prostate cancers occur. Um, it, about 75-80% are in the peripheral zone of the prostate gland. So the prostate consists of different zones, and inflammation can be anywhere, and any of these three problems can coexist. But generally, prostate enlargement is in, 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 in older men, prostatitis in slightly younger men, and prostate cancer is most commonly diagnosed in men in their 60s and early 70s, but it's, it, it, we see men with prostate cancer from as young as about 35, but usually over the age of 45. So the, the, that's where the prostate sits. Uh, there's some important nerves, I, as I've alluded to, uh, wrap around the prostate gland on both sides, and they're important when we're thinking about treatment options. And on the right of your screen, you'll see there the yellow bit of the prostate is the transition zone that grows and enlarges as we get older. So benign prostatic enlargement, or BPH as we often call it, is a quality of life issue. It's not going to kill you in reality. It's, it's, an, it's, it's an aging phenomenon, rather like arthritis. And some people have worse symptoms than others. But it's a, a big problem. It's a global problem. Um, and what we, what we want is... You know, the ideal is, is a treatment that improves our symptoms without any ill effects, without any side effects. Um, when you come along to the clinic, and uh, if you come along to one of the urology clinics, uh, we'll always be asking you to fill in questionnaires. These are val validated questionnaires, but they're a very good way of indicating to us how severe your symptoms are. And if the symptoms are mild, then it's just a question of reassurance often and let, you know, informing the patient they don't have prostate cancer and perhaps considering medication. But if the symptoms are moderate or severe, we're going to look at surgical options. 
Um, the prostate gland grows with age, that, that, that we know. Um, and so when I arrived in 2004, the following year, we, we got a green light laser machine in. And um, it's quite exciting if you're into physics, but the reality is that the laser light is in the um, visible part of the spectrum of light. And it, because it's green light, it's preferentially absorbed by anything that's red. So a very juicy vascular prostate gland, it looks a bit pink there, but they're often a bit more red than that. But they, they basically the energy is selectively uptaken by the, um, the, the benign prostate tissue and vaporized. And we can, um, it, this is something that we've been doing for over a decade here, and we've treated over a thousand people using high intensity focus ultrasound. And we, we, it's been in the DTC, we do about 90 cases a year, and 90% of patients go home within 24 hours compared to um, and about 50% go home the same day. And we're working on trying to get people out the same day because, of course, there are bed problems and it's much nicer to have a day case treatment. Um, so this is the evolution of uh, green light here. Um, we've got a bit of a track record. Tony Richards, I think, invested or in, in, a, in a, one of the early machines. That was a 20-watt laser, but we've moved over time to a 180-watt laser. And we, we got involved with a, a, a trial which was randomizing men to green light laser um, vaporization of their prostate gland as opposed to the conventional treatment which is TURP which is total urethral removal of prostate tissue using electricity and, and, and a sort of cheese wire to core out the prostate tissue. The problem with that is it's associated with more bleeding and patients are in hospital for about three days, three and a half days whereas with green light uh, they, most of them as, you, as, as I just mentioned go in within 24 hours. So last year was a bit of a it was, it was pleasing because I've had my eggs in the green light basket for a long time. And finally, um, we got some uh, positive endorsement and, and NICE uh, looked at the trial data that we were in Basingstoke was involved with and some of the Basingstoke patients were in that trial. Um, so thank you to them. And um, they concluded that if 10% more men had green light laser compared to TURP, that that would equate to a three million pound saving and they worked out essentially that it's 60 pounds cheaper for green light, but more than that, you know, people get home earlier and they get back to normal activity sooner. So to me, um, it's obvious that green light is, is superior, but, uh, you know, it's a discussion we still have and there are, there are some other options that are as good, but what, what this sort of treatment does is it, uh, it really makes a very nice big passageway through the prostate gland, and so you get quite a significant improvement in urinary symptoms. The downside is that even though we get people home the same day, it can upset the sexual function and occasionally can cause incontinence. So it can affect the ejaculatory function and the quality of the erections. In 2015, or late 2015, we introduced a new treatment uh, called Urolift. Um, and this has been endorsed very quickly. It's, it, it's, it's got all the tools <coughs> that it needed and it's been sort of fast-tracked in the NHS, which is a good thing. Uh, because sometimes it takes a long time for new technologies to get to the marketplace and, and because, you know, where it's going to help patients and unblock hospital beds, it's, it's, it's got to be a good thing. Um, and particularly when it improves the quality of life and with a reduced side effect profile. So this involves putting little implants, titanium implants, into the prostate gland. And the, the upside is that, again, it can be done very quickly as a day case. Uh, it can even be done under local anaesthetic with sedation and it doesn't cause upset to the um, sexual function, which is, which is, a, which is a bonus. Um, so so we've, we've, we've done, a, we've done you know, about 20 cases, not a lot. Um, the downside is that we are leaving an implant, and although we don't think that implant is going to be an issue, you don't kind of know what's lurking in the future in terms of other treatment options. And with implants, sometimes there can be problems down the line. Um, but they can be removed, so we should be fine. Um, so essentially, um, who is a good patient for Eurolift? And, in, and I'm going to go on and talk about another treatment, which I'm even more excited about in a minute. But the argument for Eurolift, so this is a sort of middle ground. It's not medication. It's not a bigger operation like green light or TURP. It's something that sits in the middle that particularly, you could argue that for any man it might be a good thing, but for, particularly for men who are working and want minimum time out of work and they want to get back to normal activities as soon as possible, they don't want to take medication because they get side effects from it or they just don't want to take medication because taking medication is a daily reminder that you're getting older and it's easy to forget to take the tablets. So, um, so, it's a, so Eurolift is a new approach, but we'll, we'll quickly move on from that one. But essentially, um, 
with it, you get rapid symptom relief by about two weeks, and it may not be as durable, it may not work for as long as the bigger operations, but that's not necessarily everything. Um, if I know a lot of men would rather have two, two small procedures over a decade than, than one big procedure if it meant that it preserved some important functions. So I'm hoping that the first of the videos will now work. Let's just see if it does. Um, this is a... Uh, Uh, so this is so this basically this is exciting. So because of our expertise in, in green light surgery and and uh, cut long story short, an American company, uh, the American company that produced this equipment, approached us and another uh, three or four centres in the UK and said, would we sort of pilot it in the UK? It's got FDA approval and currently um, there's approaching three-year follow-up data in the US from the trials out there. And uh, at the moment, about 1,500 men a month are having the treatment in the US, and the numbers are going up and up. Um, and it, on the 30th of March, we were the first. Um, we did the first cases in the UK, so uh, we treated 19 patients here so far, and we're the only centre to get up and running. Um, Imperial College is due to start in August, and then I think Frimley Park not long after that, and there's a hospital in Wales hoping to get started. Um, and um, so we're carefully collecting data prospectively. Um, and we've informed NICE and we've uh, ticked all the appropriate clinical governance boxes but this is a very uh, exciting uh, new treatment it's uh, essentially um, uses a little radio frequency generator in that little box there um, but uses what we call wave technology essentially it's, take, it's heating up a little 0.4 mil water droplet up to 103 degrees Celsius and injecting it into the interstitium of the prostate gland so it's basically pushing steam gently uh, into the prostate gland, which, which destroys uh, the prostate tissue. So that's how it works. Um, it causes convection, and the hot steam uh, condenses and kills the cells in the, those transition zones that you saw on the earlier slide, those yellow areas that enlarge as we get older. Um, uh, on one of the slides it was yellow, on the other it, it was a different colour, but I hope you remember. Um, so, so going back here, so what's clever about it is it just seems to work on the transitions over the prostate gland. So we do little injections into the prostate. I'm going to show you some videos in a minute. Um, we'll go on to that. So that's the handpiece that we use. That's an MRI scan on the on the on your right there, showing the area of where the where the cells are destroyed. And basically, um, that that stimulates an inflammatory response, and the body deals with that naturally, and the tissue is resorbed and disappears, thereby shrinking the prostate gland and opening up the channel uh, for improved voiding. And this is one gentleman, one month after the treatment, that was his flow beforehand. It would take him quite a few minutes to empty his bladder. Um, and there you can see the power of his flow on the second flow rate pattern. That's in mils per second of urine. Um, so a huge improvement at one month. And that's a picture of the team in Theatre 7. And uh, Theatre 7, has a, we have, we're so lucky, we have an excellent team in Theatre 7. And we had a, uh, a very experienced surgeon come over from Sweden. He'd done 900 cases uh, and had very good results, and uh, he helped us get up and running. So, um, so that's a before and after on one of the patients that's had treatment. Not, not one here. One of these are pictures from the US, but just showing uh, what happens. So, we, you know, steam was injected into that prostate gland, and that follow-up image there, I think, is uh, six months later. Um, I'm going to show you some videos now. I hope it's going to work. So you can see probably I'm a fan of green light laser surgery. But what, and that tends to be now, I would say, as we sort of adjust who we might select for this. This is for men who have um, more severe symptoms or, or have a complete stoppage uh, and can't pee. And we tend to need a bit more of a, a better disobstructing solution where we really open up that passageway. So there, the lateral loads of the prostate gland. There's the laser fiber, and we're pointing the laser, the green light laser, at 532 nanometers wavelength at the, at the prostate tissue, and it's vaporizing. So the, the, the tissue is turning to gas, so the bubbles are body tissue, and that gas is rinsed out in the, in the aqueous environment. We, use, we flush salty water through the system there to, um, to, to wash the bubbles away. So we, and we work that way. And what you can see there is there's very little bleeding. Uh, if I showed you a TURP procedure, it would be lots of bleeding. And, uh, but essentially with the green light, there's very little, as you can see. And just look at the, the way it points at the tissue. The tissue vaporizes, it turns to gas, 
um, it tends to, to, to uh, yeah, uh, and, and the tissue disappears. So we open up a nice passageway through the prostate gland. So that's towards the end of the operation. We've got a nice passageway through there, um, and, uh, and, and we get good results with that. So you can see a nice big channel there through the prostate gland. And over the next few months, um, the lining of the urethra, where it runs through the prostate there, forms a new skin. It takes a bit longer than it would if you grazed your knee, because that's a dry environment, dry environment. but uh, the aqueous environment, the moist environment in the urethra, it does take about three months to heal. Um, but men are able to get back to normal activities quite quickly. So this is what I'm obviously equally excited about, perhaps even more. This is um, something called Resume. This is a water vapor therapy. So we're not leaving implants behind, like with the Uralift procedure. We are just doing little, again, a very similar prostate to the, to the previous one. Um, for men with moderate to severe troublesome urinary symptoms who haven't perhaps had a complete stoppage where they couldn't pee, and perhaps for younger men who were very keen to get back to normal activities as soon as possible, um, this is a very good option. Uh, one of the patients um, had this treatment on a Thursday um, and he went he, um, and uh, you have to have a catheter for a few days after, which without any of these procedures, but um, one of the gentlemen that I was speaking to last week, he um, works as a warehouseman, I think, and he's very busy up and about, and he um, had the treatment on Thursday, he had to take Friday off, he came back for the catheter removal on Monday in the morning, and in the afternoon he went back to work. Um, so, I mean, that, that, that's pretty impressive. Um, we, we're doing these under local anaesthetic with some light sedation, so we're getting people out quickly. Uh, and I don't know if you could see there while I was talking, the little white thing go into the prostate tissue, and that's the little needle that goes into the tissue. And what it does is it injects that little water molecule, turns it into steam, and it's a nine-second treatment. So each time we put in a little bit of energy, uh, uh, it takes nine seconds, and we might do four treatments or six treatments or eight, depending on how big the gland is. We adjust it accordingly. So that's the nice stuff. I'm moving on to prostate cancer because time is ticking on and I've got to get through this for you. Um, so <coughs> prostate cancer, uh, this is the prostate cancer period, a pyramid. 15% of us during our lifetime as men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer. Yeah. The reality is that many more of us have prostate cancer. About 70% of us in our 70s will have microscopic evidence of prostate cancer. And we know that from post-mortem studies. So, but the reality is we only need to pick up those that have clinically significant prostate cancer, and that's where the problem lies. If we could just selectively identify the worrying prostate cancers and leave behind the non-worrying prostate cancers, that would make it an awful lot easier. So, you know, if we grabbed lots of men off the street and biopsied them, we'd find prostate cancer in a significant proportion, but we only really need to be finding those clinically important prostate cancers. 43,000 men in the, every year in the UK die of prost, uh, sorry, diagnosed with prostate cancer, and about 11,000 die. So more men live with it than die from it. Um, symptoms. There are... Symptoms that tend to be associated with the benign enlargement, but when a prostate cancer becomes more advanced, it can cause symptoms. But generally, the best way to have a, a, your prostate cancer detected early is with a PSA blood test, about which there's a lot of controversy but I think it's a good thing, and I've had mine tested, and it's fine, and I'll have it checked again. Um, so I think there's increasing evidence coming through that PSA is, is not as bad as we thought, and it's a useful thing to have checked, particularly when you're younger. Um, there will be new biomarkers coming through, and just, if I don't say now, I'll forget, but a lot of the work that we've been doing and the trials that we've been involved with in prostate cancer has been possible by collaborating with other centres, so the, in the University of Oxford, the University of Surrey, and in particular University College Hospital London. And it's by collaborating with these other centres that we've been able to work with them and bring research here to Basingstoke. And I very much believe that uh, to provide a quality clinical service, we need to be actively involved in research. So, um, so symptoms, I mean, the best thing is to have a PSA blood test, but the way we detect prostate cancer, um, I mean, yeah, I'll go on to that. So this could be anybody. This could be anybody with, with uh, you know, this is just an average male. Uh, his, his, let's say his PSA was 6.2, and then, which is slightly raised, um, that's slightly high. How, what would we do? Well, we'd repeat this blood test because it can be a bit variable, it can be a bit of a problem. So we'd like to know that a second PSA blood test is um, still at a slightly high level. 
and we want to check the urine for infection, and this chap's not, not got any infection. The next thing that we would do is we would examine the prostate gland with our finger. <laughs> that's an important thing for us to do. We would examine the prostate with our finger, and then we would also do an ultrasound scan of the prostate gland, and traditionally and take biopsies. Uh, and you can maybe pick out from that picture that the prostate gland, on ultrasound, it's hard to get the detail there. It'd be hard to identify whether there might be an area of prostate cancer or not. Um, the standard way for biopsying detecting prostate cancer has been transrectal uh, biopsies, which we, we, we are slowly moving away from. We think that, that, um, that we we're aware of the risk of infection with transrectal biopsies, and we're trying to move across to a different way of doing the biopsies, which I'll, which I'll mention in a minute. Uh, but we heard earlier about cancer targets, and we have 62 days to get patients from referral to treatment, and that is difficult, but the, the, I can say absolutely categorically that men coming through with suspected prostate cancer now get a much better deal than they ever did before. Uh, whether or not we might occasionally breach our targets, there's no doubt that um, the pathway is improving, but it's becoming more complex because we're doing more tests and we're doing it better. And that's difficult sometimes to fit all these things in very quickly in, in a relatively short time span, particularly when for prostate cancer, a lot of those prostate cancers are slowly, slowly progressive prostate cancers that aren't going to cause an immediate problem. So transrectal ultrasound guided biopsies is a bit like throwing darts at a dartboard, and this is what still many hospitals in the UK are doing, um, but fortunately we're not doing that anymore. And that's largely down to our involvement in a big trial, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so if we can detect prostate cancer earlier, the proportion of men in that grey um, area there, we can increase that. We want to pick up more <coughs> cancers when they're localised before they become advanced and spread to other bits of the body. Um, this is just a bit of clinical stuff, but basically, when we, with the transrectal through the bottom biopsies, we might think that we're hitting nicely spaced out intervals throughout the prostate gland, those little dots in green, but the reality is where those red dots are. And so the biopsies weren't sampling the prostate gland very well, they were a bit hit and miss. And we know that they missed prostate cancer in between 30 and 50% of cases. So look at that, that's an MRI picture. How much better does that look than the ultrasound? Uh, and that's a normal prostate gland, except there's some enlargement of that transition zone. You would probably now have recognised that that patient might benefit from resume water vapour therapy, uh, or possibly a green light laser. Uh, if we look at this MRI here, we, we, you, what you can't see is, this is an area of prostate cancer here. But this is what radiologists traditionally had to look at. They just had the T2 component of an MRI scan of the prostate. It's very hard to say whether or not there's prostate cancer on that picture there. Uh, but if we now, well, what we now do is multi-parametric MRIs where we interrogate the prostate gland in different ways. And some of you will know, because you'll have had MRIs of the prostate, it does take a bit longer. It takes 35 or 40 minutes in the scan. But what we get with that is we get um, diffusion-weighted images that show a, a dark area um, in, in, in that corresponds with the dark area on the T2 image. And when we also give contrast, when we give dye, and that bit of the prostate gland lights up, we have a much greater level of certainty that that corresponds to an area of prostate cancer. So that is a multi-parametric MRI. There are several parameters, several ways that we interrogate the MRI scan. Um, and I was very lucky and fortunate to be involved in a big study. Uh, with, it was a £3.6 million pound grant. And Basingstoke was one of the major recruiters in that study. UCL recruited about 250. We recruited 130, and then there were another nine hospitals that recruited a small number. So we did phenomenally well, and again, I'm so grateful to every, everybody that participated in this study, which essentially has changed the diagnostic pathway, um, and in a way obviously made it difficult with our cancer targets, but we're going to, we're going to try and just keep improving to get, the, to get, get, thing, get people through as quickly as we can. Increasingly, we're doing biopsies where we go through the perineum, that's the bit that we sit on when we ride a bike, um, simply because it's a flatter bit of our anatomy. To take biopsies through the bottom, between the bottom cheeks, isn't that easy? Um, and we can apply a grid and we can take much more regimented um, biopsies um, using that approach. So in this PROMISE trial, all the patients had um, an MRI scan and blinded had biopsies as well, and then we looked at all the results at the end. Uh, and, um, and this is what it showed. So 
what it showed was that MRI was had a sensitivity of 93%. So that means that it really only missed about 7% of prost significant prostate cancers compared to transrectal biopsy. This was rubbish. And the negative predictive value was also much better, which you want in a diagnostic test. So MRI hugely outperforms the transrectal biopsies. And similarly, in this PROMISE trial, what's uh, uh, interesting is that the um, transrectal biopsy missed, there were 700 men in this study, but um, the uh, transrectal biopsies missed um, 119 clinically significant prostate cancers. So it sort of confirmed what we really knew. So the conclusions of this big trial were, was that uh, essentially we should have MRI at the start of our diagnostic pathway um, and this was published in The Lancet and really received also a lot of um, publicity um, uh, uh, a few months ago. So the diagnostic pathway has now changed. So if we suspect prostate cancer based on the PSA blood test or, or a prostate gland that feels abnormal uh, or troublesome urinary symptoms or a combination, um, you will get an MRI scan uh, before you have a biopsy. What that will do, it, was a, it will enable us not to have to biopsy at least 30 if not 35% of men. So some men won't need to proceed to biopsy. So we're hoping that the additional cost of doing more MRIs will be at least largely offset by the reduced number of patients having to go on and have biopsies. Um, and the cost of somebody having a transrectal biopsy and ending, ending up in intensive care is obviously extremely expensive and something we, we want to avoid if we possibly can. What, the, doing the MRI scan, the next question, the next step is, well, you know, now we can see where the cancers are, um, what's the best way of biopsying them? Do we need to take as many biopsies as we were before? Can we not just target the area that we want to target. And certainly at the top of my shopping list is to um, hopefully um, regularly use some software that will enable us to hit the target. When we're taking biopsies, we have to use ultrasound. We actually have to have that hazy image you saw earlier. But what we can do is we can marry the MRI images with the ultrasound and overlay them using very clever ways so that we actually have targets to aim for. And using that grid system, uh, we can very accurately hit the target. Um, I don't know if this is one of my videos, no, this is just, um, yeah, so by fusing the ultrasound and the MRI images, we can get better quality biopsies. Um, we're at, I'm going to just speed through there. Um, so, and that then leads us on just to my final bit, which is about prostate cancer treatment. So if we can map out better where the cancer is and where it isn't, and we can see it, and we have a 3D understanding of where the disease is, it opens the door to focal therapy. Um, which is something that we've been doing at Basingstoke for uh, 10 years. And we have a lot of experience in high intensity focused ultrasound. We have some experience in cryotherapy, which is freezing. And we are getting more and more referrals from around the country. I saw a chat today from Sheffield. I've just had a referral from Bolton. Um, and although some patients can go to London because there are centres there, uh, I think many of them would rather, rather go around the M25 and out in this direction down the M3. And essentially, a lot of prostate cancers are not very aggressive. And so some men have this dilemma where, where the issue is we can survey your prostate cancer and monitor it. And there's no doubt we can monitor the prostate cancer much better than we ever could with MRI and with the PSA and with common sense. But now we've got a visual of where the disease is. Um, and for some men who don't want to go on and have a radical treatment, which seems a bit too much for them, and they're worried about it upsetting their continence and leaking urine and worried about the erections, um, high-intensity focused ultrasound targeted to the, where the cancer is um, is uh, a very good option. And, um, and we published some early work jointly with UCL in 2012 in The Lancet, and more recently we pre presented our Basingstoke data at, uh, in Boston at the American Neurology Association <coughs> and essentially you know it's looking very promising I think there will be other technologies that follow but we're now on a journey which is to explore focal therapy for prostate cancer uh, you'll be aware that not all women now have a radical mastectomy for breast cancer and I think we're on a similar similar journey for men with prostate cancer some are calling it the male lumpectomy but I'm not quite sure that <laughs> appropriate uh, and the good thing about these treatments is that somebody like Bill Wyman might be attracted to it. He hasn't had one of these treatments, but again, the Daily Mail speculated recently that he might be a good candidate because, of course, 
uh, he needs to be thinking about um, maintaining all the important uh, things and structures. Um, so, so that's really the end of my talk. I, I've run over by two minutes, so I apologise. Um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them, but we may just decide just to finish. So I'll, I'll thank you all very much for um, listening.